Welcome. We are so glad that you are here today on this Easter Sunday. Whether this is your first Sunday worshiping among us, or whether you've been here all of your life, we are grateful that you are here today on this, the holiest day of the year. And if you had trouble finding a parking spot this morning, I'm awfully sorry about that. (laughs) But I'll make you a deal. Come back next week, you won't have that problem. (laughs) May I share with you a secret? My Easter sermon always takes me the longest to write. We have many pastors in our congregation, and I wonder whether they'd say the same. Easter is a difficult day to preach on, not because it's the holiest day of the year, which it is, not because the sanctuary is full, which it is, It's not because the resurrection story is so obscure, but rather because it is so familiar. Many of you have been attending Easter worship all of your lives, and you know every inch of the resurrection story. So what more can I offer to this incredible tale? Maybe we ought to just tell the story. It's interesting to note, and you are likely aware of this, that the gospel writers tell this story a bit differently. Matthew tells us that at the resurrection there is a great earthquake, and an angel came down from heaven like a lightning bolt. John tells us that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene at the cemetery but she mistakes him for the gardener. And when she realizes who he is, she runs and finds the others and preaches the very first Easter sermon, I have seen the Lord. But as Mark tells the story, the version we're studying today, Easter begins with fear. Interestingly enough, Easter, according to Mark, begins with fear. Mary Magdalene and another Mary and Salome go to the tomb early in the morning, expecting to find Jesus' body. They brought with them oils and spices so that they might wash Christ's body. They've come to rinse the blood off of his skin smooth his hair, maybe rub some myrrh into his skin. They've come to anoint his body and prepare it for being sealed up into the tomb. As they walk to the cemetery, Mark tells us that they wonder aloud to each other who will move the large boulder so that they might gain access to the cave. But that question proves moot. For when they arrive, the stone has been rolled away. So they walk right in. They walk into that tomb, which is completely empty, except for a young man. A young man, not Jesus. A young man dressed in white, saying, you are looking for Jesus, but he is not here. He has been raised. Go tell the others. Do not be afraid. Apparently, the women don't hear that last line. Because Mark tells us that the women were afraid. He tells us that they flee in terror and amazement. This is very interesting to me. 
When they heard Jesus is not here, he has been raised, that should have created a sense of wonder and excitement and praise. But Mark tells us that they were afraid. Why do you suppose that is? Were they afraid because they missed their chance to anoint Jesus' body? Were they afraid because not only had Jesus' life been taken from him, but now apparently his body had been stolen too? Were they afraid because yet once more death seemed to be the victor? Or were they afraid because Jesus wasn't in there? Which must mean, of course, that he is out there. And who knows what a risen and on the loose Jesus might ask of you and me. If Jesus is alive, then we might be too. I was at a conference some years ago. I don't think any of you were there, but perhaps you were. But regardless, you know the kind of meeting I'm talking about. A thousand or so preachers and lay leaders are gathered in this large convention hall, and we're having one of those god-awful business sessions. You know, you know what I'm talking about. There are microphones dispersed all among the crowd where folks get up to say something like, I'd like to make a motion to approve the amendment to the alternate motion to be referred to the sub-sub-subcommittee, which we'll study for the next 10 years. <laughs> it was one of those kinds of meetings. So there we were in this dark downtown convention hall and the moderator calls on someone. The chair recognizes microphone three. Yes, sir, microphone three. Would you like to speak for or against the motion? And the spotlight shines on microphone three. And standing there is a homeless man who has wandered in from off the street. He looks around and says, what in the world is this? Aren't you those folks who follow the man who turned water into wine? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> and I heard roughly 800 seconds to that motion. We all immediately go out into the reception hall and an impromptu celebration and yes, a little wine broke out. We laughed, talked, joked, caught up with one another and bragged on our churches back home. Sure, pastors do that, of course. And as we did all this, we began to realize what should have been so obvious to us. We were there to represent Jesus Christ. We were there to represent Christ who is not dead, Christ who is alive. And if Christ is alive, maybe we ought to at least look like it ourselves. It was during my last year of seminary, back in 2004. I was an intern at Grace Baptist Church, just down the road from here. I was teaching Sunday school on Easter Sunday morning. And the title of the lesson I was teaching was Practicing Resurrection. The author of the lesson was making the point that resurrection is something that we experience every day. That every day, you and I, we have the opportunity to practice resurrection. But there was one older woman in the class who sat there with her arms folded for most of the lesson. 
About halfway through the lesson, I made the mistake and stopped and asked for questions. She said, Daniel, not a question, but a comment. I think this is blasphemy. My goodness, okay, say more. Resurrection, she said, is something that Jesus did by the power of God. We can't be raised from the dead. Oh, yes, we can, I said. Jesus did not rise from the grave so you and I could stay inside. Standing outside his own empty tomb, Jesus is calling us to new life. I love how Ronald Lucky puts it. He says, Easter is about more than, the, than a fortunate Jewish rabbi being raised from the dead. Easter is about the whole world being raised when he was raised. Easter gives us the hope that the way things have always been will not always be because Jesus is alive. Indeed, the Easter story is about the miraculous resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we make a grave mistake, pardon the pun, if we leave the story there. For Easter's resurrection is right now, for you and me, and not tomorrow, but today. Let's think about it, church. At Easter, we don't say Jesus Christ was risen, do we? We say Christ is risen. And that's more than just a grammatical construction that is proclaiming a truth that we believe. Christ is risen today. For every time some lonely heart wakes up and begins to believe again, Christ is risen. Every time you extend to someone a second chance, Christ is risen again. Anytime someone offers to you a second chance, Christ is risen again. Every time we look into the eyes of someone whom we've hurt deeply and say, I'm so sorry, will you forgive me? Christ is risen again. Every time we gather in this place for worship and for praise and for fellowship, every time we shake hands with one another and hug each other's necks and realize that indeed we are brothers and sisters, Christ is risen again. My dear friends, the resurrection God gave to Jesus on Easter morning is the resurrection that God gives to you and me every single day. Anne Lamott is one of my favorite writers. If you haven't read anything by her, I, I encourage you to do so. Fair warning, her language is a bit salty, but she's real. She writes about when her firstborn, when her first son Sam was born, she kept a diary. She was a single mother, had very little money. She was brand new to the Christian faith and she was struggling. She says, I was struggling financially, emotionally, and spiritually. And here's what she wrote in her diary. Last night, I decided that it is just totally nuts to believe in Christ. That it's every bit as crazy as being an agnostic, really. But as soon as I had that thought, something amazing happened to me. And says a man from church showed up at the door, smiling and waving to me and Sam, and I went to let him in. His name is Gordon. He's married to our associate pastor. We, ex we exchanged pleasantries, and Gordon said, 
Margaret and I wanted to do something special for you and for the baby. So let me ask you, what if a fairy appeared on your doorstep and said that he or she would do any favor for you at all, anything you wanted around the house done, but were too exhausted to do by yourself? What would that be? Anne says, oh, you don't want to do that. Gordon says, yes, I do, and I'm not leaving until you tell me. What do you need done around the house? She said, I can't say. It's, it's rather horrible. Anne says, he just stood there. I became convinced that he wouldn't leave until I actually told him so I did. I said, it would be to clean the bathroom. Gordon ended up spending an hour scrubbing the bathtub, the toilet, the sink with Ajax and a lot of hot water. And says, I sat on the couch while he worked feeling vaguely guilty and nursing my son to sleep. But it made me feel sure of Christ again, of that kind of love. For here is a man on his knees scrubbing a new mama's bathtub, and that is what Jesus means to me. She writes, in the midst of my sorrow, my struggle, and even my doubt, Christ has arisen for me once again. The resurrection that God gave to Jesus Christ is the same resurrection that God gives to you and me every single day. Do you believe that? You may not believe it, but you did just sing about it. I love the hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, and we began our service by singing it together. And there's that one line in the hymn that gets me choked up every time. Made like him, like him, we rise. Because Christ has risen, so can we. Maybe your marriage is stagnant. Maybe you're dealing with addiction. Maybe you're praying to find a mate. Or maybe you're worried about your children. Or maybe you're still struggling to get out of bed and your friends don't understand because they keep saying, come on, he's been dead almost a year. My dear friends, wherever death has you in its grip, wherever you have given up, Christ rolls back the stone and calls you to rise again. Standing outside his empty tomb, hear him call you by name and say, My child, it's time to rise. Well, Pastor, that all sounds fine and good. What does this resurrection even look like? I'm so glad you asked. About a year ago, I received a note. It's not the kind of note that I receive very often, so I want to share it with you. It was written to me by a young woman named named Katrina. Dear Pastor Daniel, you probably don't remember me. Oh, yes, I do. 
I came to your church a couple months ago. I needed help finding a place to stay. My boyfriend was hurting me nearly every day. So one afternoon after he went to work, I grabbed my baby and we left with whatever clothes I could fit in my backpack. I was so embarrassed to come to that big, beautiful church on the corner and ask for help. And I was so afraid. Daniel, I sat in my car for more than 30 minutes asking Jesus to give me the courage to come inside. But after I talked with you, you helped me get a motel room for the night. You called one of your church members and they brought over some diapers and formula for my daughter. And then that saint gave me money for a bus ticket to go back home. It was a long bus ride, but we finally made it back to Tennessee. My mama helped me find an apartment near her, and guess what? The grocery store down the street said I can start next week. You remember as I got up to leave, I asked you, how can I pay your church back? You told me, just go help someone else. Well, I asked my sister to move in with me. She was in a bad way too. And she's helping me with child care and I'm helping her with rent. Oh, and we found a church too. Things are still tight. But I'm making it. With God's help, I'm making it. Please tell River Road Church, thank you. Well, I better run, she says. The baby needs to get up from her nap. I hope you and your church have a wonderful Easter next week. I've already had mine. If you ask me, church, that's what resurrection looks like. So happy Easter, Katrina. Happy Easter, church. Look alive. Put a smile on your face because Jesus Christ is not dead. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah and amen.